Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm ready for today's episode. I think uh, we have a lot of our Compose developments to go over, not so much news, and uh, we have, if you couldn't tell by the title, we're going over the dashboard, <laughs> catching some flack from you earlier on that before the show. <laughs> we're just we're just being as, as straightforward and, I was and gonna transparent say. as possible. <laughs> But how are you doing over there? You doing all right? Good, yeah. Just got back from the uh, the grocery store, stocked back up, so I'm fully fueled and uh, ready to go. Uh, and and actually, I'm just gonna dive in if you if you're okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 first article I have here is charity or excuse me, <laughs> clarity is an underrated skill as as I demonstrate <laughs> for you right here. Uh, this is from Tom Gammon. Uh, I don't necessarily where you know where he's coming from or, or his background. I'm, I'm assuming software developer. But I thought this was interesting. Had, had you gotten a chance to take a look at this, Jack? I did. I really liked it. Um, especially avoiding... Basically, when he was talking about clarity, the one thing I took away was that um, being explicit on things and fully going full, full circle with explaining them rather than just saying, no, this is why we're not doing this. I, I don't know if that's kind of how you felt. What did you think of the article or do you want to go over the article? Give a quick summary of it. Um, yeah, I'll go, I'll give a quick summary. So Tom goes over three points that he believes to be important when being clear. He says to increase, increase clarity in my own communication. I try and follow these three rules, make the implicit explicit, be succinct, and avoid ambiguous pronouns. Yep. The first and third, I believe, are fairly obvious. Make the implicit explicit. Yeah. This is hard to do if you don't start thinking about it, uh, but once it does, it, it becomes second nature. For instance, whenever I start explaining something or, or even just rationalizing something through in the middle of a conversation, what I'll do is imagine, I'll, I'll basically do rubber ducky debugging, right? So I will make sure that I'm explaining to someone what I'm trying to explain. Right? Yeah. So, so something, so explaining something very simple and walking it through step by step uh, to, to something that is, you know, well, in this case, an inanimate object. So they're not going to have any implicit understanding and, and we're not going to come into the table with any kind of assumptions. We're just going to say, all right, let's, let's be as explicit as we can. We're not going to take anything for granted that we don't have to. So that is that that's just a good rule to live by I found. Uh, the last one as well seems fairly specific, um, avoiding ambiguous pronouns, which is not a bad rule to have, not something I've necessarily focused on in the past, but something that I could see if it helps. He says here avoiding or excuse me, he says ambiguous pronouns such as it or this can make it unclear what you're referring to, especially in long or complex paragraphs. Right. Totally. And, and I think that's just a good rule in general for writing, avoiding ambiguous pronouns. Now, I agree with you that the first and third are kind of just general writing skills. Now, what did you think about... So making the implicit explicit, I really liked how you kind of went over that. Obviously, we cannot implement a turbo router. But I liked how in the example that he used that, so he kind of said, the example sentence was, obviously we cannot use turbo turbo router. And he said, that's a bad example, but, but a bad way to write it. But the better way is to say, we cannot impl implement a turbo router because it's too expensive for our budget this quarter. Kind of providing that, hey, this is why we can't do this. Instead of just stating no flat out, it gives kind of the reason with it and you know, maybe it makes the obvious to him or the writer um, obvious obvious to the other person, basically. Yeah, so that's something that I I'm fairly comfortable with. The second one is one that I think is a is a maturation of the first one because to make the implicit explicit almost always requires you to expand on what you're doing, your your initial thought, 
so in in his example about not implementing this technology turbo router he starts off with the phrase obviously we cannot implement a tur turbo router and you're like okay that has a lot of implicit assumptions so he makes stuff explicit and he says we cannot implement it we cannot implement a turbo router because it is too expensive for our budget this quarter that is necessarily longer than obviously we cannot do it so his second rule puts restrictions on his first it says make the implicit explicit and then he immediately shoehorns it and says but you also have to be succinct so when explaining why you cannot implement a turbo router, it's going to be in your best interest to explain it with the relevant information and exclude everything else. You don't need all of the details around the design process or uh, other conversations that have, that have been had. As you're laying out what needs to be explicit, make it succinct and only the relevant information. On the face of these, it seems contradictory. I mean, it it really does. If you're trying to make something succinct, the the easiest way to you so want to be as clear as possible is, and say as little as possible is what I think succinct. I don't know if that's how you feel, or if that's yes. what you think. Yeah, it, 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 at least at least a necessary level of clarity, right? You you have to be you have to be able to get the entire idea across. And then you have to be able to get the entire idea across without droning on and on and on and on and on about it. Right. And you also don't want to miss details, though, is that kind of in the middle, that sandwich there. You don't want to provide not enough. You don't want to provide too much. you got to find that sweet spot. Now, I don't know if you saw the last line that kind of delivers that exact thing home. It's uh, – I'm going to – morph it a little bit he says uh, a picture may be worth a thousand words but a hundred good words are worth he says a thousand bad ones i think a hundred good words are worth <laughs> more than a thousand bad ones i mean you want to be clear right you don't need to say a thousand words what can be said in a hundred i think that's what he's trying to say but just thought i'd bring that up yeah there's a very interesting parallel in proverbs uh, in the Bible, Proverbs twenty six four and five, and and, and I've I've talked about this a, a couple times with with some of the guys. But Proverbs twenty six four says, "Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him." Right? And then Proverbs twenty six five says, "Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes." So you have these these two reasons fighting against each other. Am I supposed to answer a fool according to his folly? Or am I not supposed to answer a fool according to his folly? And the, the answer is, it depends. Um, more specifically, you, you know, be, be wise in deciding what approach is going to be the best, right? Because it doesn't just give you the rule. It gives you the explanation. It's like, well, if he's going to be wise in his own eyes, if you don't respond to him, then you're, you're going to want to respond to him. If if you are coming down to his level, right, if you are necessarily tempering your argument or, or you know, lowering yourself in, in order to answer him according to, to his folly, then, yeah, it's, it's going to be a bad time. So you have to, in this situation, hold that duality in your head and say, what approach is going to work for me? With this and and the same thing with this clarity, you, you you say, all right, I have to be explicit, right? But I can't be overly explicit, or else I'm I'm not going to be succinct. So if you can hold those in your head and you can you can kind of juggle them back and forth, then you'll be in a you'll you'll be in a good spot. Yeah, it context is important. Context is important. So I just thought that was that was fun. I I, I love the little head games. Uh, so I thought that was a that was a fun head game uh, to play. And speaking of head games, um, if you've heard anything about the IRC network free nodes recent kerfluffle, um, there was there was a lot going on that there. I linked an article, and 
there is there is just a lot going on with this. So I'm not going to dive into to to the details. I don't know if if you had any. Basically, what I saw was it looked like a lot of integrations between different services and IRC were being not dropped, but just not developed on. Um, I saw the you know I, I the one thing I saw was Slack drop support because I guess it IRC doesn't support emojis, which I thought was a very kind of dumb reason not to support IRC. There was there was a lot of complaints about the Freenode network, right? And not only that, but there was a lot of moves being made by Freenode network management, which was new and suspect, like it's suspect moves um, and, and, and stuff that would just be red flags in any kind of business. Uh, and, and, and a lot of, a lot of contextual questions and, and, you know, why, why people were doing it that way. Um, and a lot of backroom deals and a lot of that. Um, and there was, uh, there was something that caused whatever the straw was that, that broke the camel's back, some, some leaked document or, or, or something and the the resignation letter from from a staffer called Christian, um, he after helping on the network for ten years, you know, he he publicly said, "I'm not going to do this." And then him and an entire swath of IRC networks immediately set up camp at this new Libera chat a service. Okay. Right? Yeah. So. You, you look at it from one angle, there's a lot of backroom deals and a lot of weird stuff going on with the management and the management just changed hands and it's kind of backwards the way the, the actual acquisition happened and the guy they sold it to is whatever. And then the other side of it is like everyone jumped ship all at the same time to all go to this one chat service and it looks less like cancel culture and it looks like more like a, a coordinated a- effort to... Which could be, you know, just people having these grievances for a while and, and talking amongst themselves about it. And everything, there, there's nothing that's being litigated right now, uh, but it is causing a, a big schism because Freenode is a right. mainstay of the open source community. I mean, IRC is where you hopped on in the 80s and the 90s and the aughts to find people to help you out with your problems. I mean, there wasn't Google back then, right? There, There wasn't a whole bunch of different forums and question and answer sites. Right. I mean, you, you hopped on this or Usenet to to talk to other people to, to find out answers to your questions. So with Freenode being the biggest by far, I think it had something like 65% of the IRC network traffic um, or more uh, out of all of the IRC networks, IRC being the protocol, Freenode being the network itself. Um, and several tens of thousands of people have now jumped ship and, and gone to Libera chat. Uh, so it's, it's just a big move in the, in the software world. Um, we used it at the open source club. Uh, Mozilla uses it. Uh, there are plenty of other projects I'm trying to remember. Cause I've, I've been, I've been going through these podcasts for days about all these continuous updates and, and, you know, all of this, and I don't have a take on it only that, there are other standards that people can jump to. I mean, I know IRC has been around for a long, long time, but I think Matrix really pulls ahead of that. IRC has just kind of been around, and I think Matrix is... I think it's going to start to pull ahead here. Now, yeah. we'll see if that comes to reality, but at this point in time, it looks like, you know, Riot, Matrix... The Matrix protocol is... I don't know. What, I don't know if I would call it better. You know, it's hard. Subje- it's hard to make an objective point that it's better, but I I like it more. I like it more than IRC. So I don't know. I guess we'll just have to see where it goes. I, what are your thoughts on that? Do you prefer Matrix over IRC? Oh, it's a drop of a hat. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in in addition to that, I mean. Li- Libera Chat has already set up an official uh, IRC matrix bridge, like within days of this happening. So that's already set up and and running. the uh, The open source club has already switched over to a new one, and I didn't have to care because I just 
join the Libera chat one through my same matrix client. I'm like, all right, done. This is easy. Like, I don't know what the big fuss is. <laughs> okay. And it makes, it makes moving easier. I mean, honestly, if, if you lower the barrier to people going away from hostile networks, you're not going to have hostile networks. People are going to want to keep the mind sharing. You know, they're, they're going to need to appease the people who are in there. So I, I just think all in all matrix is going to be the better bet, but I, I don't mind being bridged to IRC. People don't want emojis. That's their fault. It works. I mean, and I, I feel like every protocol does have some sort of Brit. I shouldn't say every protocol, every platform, uh, you know, I say Slack and, you know, Riot and some of these, all these, I feel like apps just have an IRC bridge anymore, or at least the availability with an integration to say, Hey, yeah, you can bridge with IRC. So, well, and, and matrix too. I mean, matrix, you, you, you can, you can go into Slack. You can go into Mattermost, you can go into Telegram, you can go into Discord, you can go into Twitch chat even. Like nice. There's there's tons of stuff you can do with that. Um so I I think it's it's really poised to to take off here. So I don't I don't see any downside and and they just put spaces in beta. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I pinged I pinged you about that. I did see that. How many how many chat rooms are you in? Uh, in Matrix or just in general or just in general, just in general, because oh, I kind of want to talk gosh. about this Dunbar number thing, but like I, I want to kind of figure out like how so, you how you manage that. I'm loosely, I would say loosely, in a lot of chat room. Ooh, like, mm -hmm. I would say so. I have. I'll just look right here. Rooms I'm in. One. Now is this on Matrix or so, is this everywhere? Just just Matrix. I have 14. Okay. That I'm in. Now, some of that is drive by just hop in for support and then i'll just you know some of them it's projects i like to just follow kind of watch um most of it's lurking i would say just watching everything kind of flow in as opposed to being active and then uh i have like three slack ones i'm in uh and then i'm trying to think i have a couple Are you on Discord I, have at one, all? uh i was for a little bit just for su drive by support stuff i was like looking at a project and i was like hey top them to discord and they're like basically it, one of the things was the licensing issue and i was like hey can i run this project as this and they said no buy our product i'm like no i came here to look for support on running my own instance of this <laughs> so i'm i would say i'm on discord but not active at all it's very much drive by um then there was one more oh uh i had a so it was a co-worker uh it was his friend that has a Mattermost instance up. So I'm in that as well. And that's like a couple, There's a, there are a handful of rooms in there. I was pretty active on that for a while because that was all, that was actually pretty close. Um, there was like six guys, seven guys, you know, I think he had like 30 users or whatever, but it was like six of us that were pretty active. Um, do you use, do you use GroupMe at all? I had it on my phone. I don't have it on my phone anymore. It's not, I found it super useful just because I never put it on my phone and yeah. I just use their group text number. So like yeah. you can... You can have one number per group text, and you just just chat with put it, whoever basically. you want because because you yeah. can you can access it on the web. Yeah, 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 yeah. And especially with like Nextcloud's contact book, I have all my contacts right there, right? And I just put them into to group me, and I say, hey, who wants to go frisbee golfing today, right? Or hey, you know, are we still having study on Saturday, yeah. right? And it makes it super easy because you still only need a phone number, right? right. But I can use it from my web. Uh, for my browser, um, and actually, guess who has a bridge to it too? <laughs> Is it Matrix does. Matrix? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah yeah. So it's That's awesome. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. I'm not going to dive into the Dunbar number here. It it just looks like there are some people on May 11th who were like, "Uh, we actually think it needs to be more ambiguity am, 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 ambiguous." What do you mean? Um, well, they said. Or what do they mean? They said uh, Dunbar posted his theories decades ago, long before social media sites. Uh, this number would still make sense if we relied on Rolodex instead of, you know, uh, social media. Sure. And then he's like, um, his theory is still viable. 
Since the quality of connections on social networks is often low, these aren't personalized relationships, he said. Yeah. So I'm I would just, kind I'm of just... I would kind of agree with that to a um to a sense. I mean, most of these chats I hop in are they aren't based around the person. That I think we've had this conversation before. They aren't based around the people, they're based around the technology. Maybe we had this uh, maybe in an earlier episode. I I'd have to go back and find it. So rather than getting to know the person, you're really just talking, you know, getting to know who these people are or whatever. You're really just getting to know the technology and the people behind the technology. Not, not I wouldn't even say the people behind the technology. It's basically kind of the technology itself as for a lot of these group chats. You're getting only one part of that person, though. You know, people. I feel like people are pretty dynamic. You only get the one part. So that's at least what I've kind of seen or what I see. Okay, yeah, I had one thing I wanted to jump in here jump in here with the one you you could call it a news item or intro Uh, i'm gonna call it intro here so i think last episode we talked on bashing mit for uh putting out a research paper that was basically are they able to submit vulnerable code to the kernel the linux kernel and apologies all apologies out to mit um we're probably not going to go back and edit that podcast, but we do want to make the correction right here. That was actually Minnesota. <laughs> I think it was uh, researchers from University of Minnesota cemented intentional faulty code to the Linux kernel and almost got away with it. Um, so basically a research group uh, was submitting code to the kernel that was vulnerable. Basically, um, the kernel developers kind of found out and said, Hey, you can't do this. And they actually took it to the limit where they are not going to allow any more commits from anyone at that entire university. It says uh, right here from the article, because of these actions, the entire university was banned from submitting patches to the Linux kernel. So, I mean, at the end of the day, they were just wasting people's time. And uh, granted, they wanted to do it, wanted to do it for advancement and science. And a lot of people depend on depend on the Linux kernel, but there's a white way of doing things in a wrong one and they just kind of pick the wrong one. So. And they've also, I don't know if you heard about it, but they went back and reviewed like 500 other commits from these, these, that same institution. And, and that took a lot of people's time too. So they're still wasting people's time. Right. This fallout is, is still hurting people. Right. Um, but we wanted to share some of our developments uh, that yeah. you know people aren't wasting our time, so we're yeah, able to get done. Absolutely. Um, and we've been we've been cranking away at these things here, so we've got we've got a couple different things. Uh, first of all, is the services YouTube video, uh, so we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but we put that out. That is uh, the it second is of three videos. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty good. Uh, I really enjoyed making that. Uh, and, that was fun. And Jack, I yeah. hope you did too. Uh, I mean, yeah. it was it was just a fun day. Like we're we're running all over the place, putting together these videos, and uh, doing take after take, and just uh, un- until we we felt good about it. It was it was it was a learning process and, and and very fun. But I think we got across what we wanted to in that video. So if you want to go ahead and, and take a look, it'll be up on YouTube, and we'll have a link to it in the the show notes here. Uh, the next, and then I was gonna say on top of that. Uh, check out the command center front page when you're signing up because mm-hmm. you'll see that services YouTube video right there. Exactly. So we yeah. updated so the, wanna... uh, don't go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No. I was going to say, so we updated the command center front page. Basically we added the YouTube video right there and uh, just kind of switched some stuff around. But our goal here, I know we have coming up before the end of the quarter is to kind of get an easy sign on going. Um, so if you are interested in, signing up for an R Compose instance, we will be able to kind of walk you through that very hassle-free. Now, it's pretty easy right now, but if you want to reach out directly to us via email or whatever, it's basically going to be an easier onboarding process. But we're, and I think that's the still most development. important The most important thing right now uh, is to sign up for the mailing list, uh, yeah, which as absolutely. well is, is on the front page right there. That'll keep yeah. you up to date with... All this stuff that we're doing, uh, all the the side stuff we put out. Uh, if, if this is the only thing you listen to, we've got a lot of other things, other like content this out there, right? Service video. We've got integration discussions. We've got uh, you know different different other articles that we're putting out too. So so there's a lot that 
that we're doing in addition to developing this and in addition to simply this podcast. Uh, so sign up for the mailing list and we'll make sure you get all those updates as well as when we have these kind of major releases or these uh, these these turning points uh, where we have uh, different things coming down the pipe. Uh, so definitely, definitely fun to see that. I'm just going to keep rolling through here. So uh, working on Portal, like we had talked about last episode, uh, last we were talking about having given Portal the ability to view the environment, um, and and now it has the ability to manipulate it on disk. Uh, so that was that was something really cool. So building off of what what Jack did, I took it and added a couple different features onto it. The first one is the ability to modify it on disk, and then for instances that are on uh, compositional enterprise infrastructure, the ability to add that to our ecosystem, which in this case is a Git repository that that stores that information in a version controlled manner. And this allows you know anyone who wants to self host an instance to do so, uh, but also it allows us to continue our ability to uh, provide value when it comes to backups and uh, additional services and whatever else we need, right? This is this is this is our way of, of providing that ecosystem around the, the product, which will always be open source. Um, and then also Jack added uh, the the starting point for looking into statuses of stuff and and exposing the the nginx logs in portal. Yeah, which right now it's very simple. It's a it's just kind of out there. I'd call it a very much a 1.0 or a 0.0 .0 even. <laughs> um, it's out there, but now that we have it out there, we have a a base is what I'd say. We have that base to go from and look at all the logs right now. I think it's specifically proxy logs and engine X logs, but down the road, we want to be able to provide the ability to look at service logs. Basically, if you have next cloud deployed, it's going to show, Hey, these are the logs. You know, this is kind of what next cloud is saying. If you're running into issues or if you want to look at those logs. Yeah. So exciting stuff. Uh, even, even coming down the pipe further still, um, and there were a couple things that I don't think I got to go over that I've been running into this week. So yeah, uh, one of them was that the comparison script is miss was missing some of the version of the app. So I wrote a script basically to give us an overview. I think I touched on it one one of the episodes here. Uh, the the script which gives us a snapshot of what we have currently in each of our supported versions, as well as what we have in master and what we. Uh, are looking at upstream so like what the the latest upstream versions are and we can compare that see if we need to do updates and migration tests yada 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 well that was failing for the bottom half of all the services and i couldn't figure out for the life of me why well and what happens along with docker hub's rate limiting that they put in place for old uh, images they also rate limited some of the unauthenticated api access and so I basically just put a 30 second sleep timer in after I hammered the crap out of that API and then hammered the crap out of it again. Again. <laughs> Good old sleep 30. <laughs> well, and, and that was all I need, right? I'm only, I'm only hitting a, a very few number right. of apps. Right. And I'm just hitting them in order to get Late the versions service. for yeah. for the script so once once that gets pulled down i'm i'm done like that's that's all i need so um i could i could do that one every 10 seconds i don't i don't necessarily care how long this this runs it's just easier if it doesn't <laughs> yeah. right so uh that that was something i ran into there was also another timeout that i ran in with gitlab where the environment wouldn't clone down uh, and i had to in implement a until loop in order to wait for that to, to come down again. The, the, the interesting part about that was the way I had to deal with the error handling because in, in bash, if you, if you run a bash script with set dash E, then that will error out on any kind of error, right? So you either have to catch all the errors that you are think you think are going to happen, or you're going to be erring out in them. Well, if you catch an error, you can't check for the return code of that command. 
So like if the get clone failed, the return code would be non-zero. But if I catch that error and then I do, you know, d yeah, yeah. If, if I catch it and do that, you know, dollar sign question mark to get the return value of the last executed command, the last executed command is what was executed after it was caught. So I'm like, what do I do at that point? And the recommended way of, of handling that is to basically just set a bool. Uh, well, in this case, it's zero and one, right? So, so implement a variable and say, you know, variable equals one. Uh, and then you can do an if statement on that variable afterwards and, and test it, you know, whatever conditional you want. And not only that, but I even got a little fancier. I didn't even set that variable first because one of the the bashisms, so something that isn't in regular sh, but but in bash, you can uh, inside of a conditional, inside of yeah. a dollar sign curly brace uh, variable inside of a conditional, you can have it default to something, and you can either have it default for that specific variable instance, or you can assign it as a default. Sure. Yeah. And which is just with like the variable name and then uh, colon negative and then whatever or colon equals whatever and then that will either assign it or that will just for that instance for that conditional use that as a default so i can i can test it with a default of zero and then if it exists it will exist as one because it will have been set because of the error handling uh, and then i can go ahead and say all right so we did error out Let's go ahead and, and run that if statement. So that was that was pretty fun. That's actually all in the play compositional repo. Uh, that was fun to, to be able to go through and, and just kind of, well, and, and that was something I've been doing at work too, that exact same scenario where I had to handle a failure, right? And I didn't want my script to be, you know, non-erroring. Like I, I always want my scripts to error out if something fails, right? So, so I had to, I had to, learn that and, and go through that. I'm sure it's something I'd learned a long time ago, but have since forgot. So I was, I was glad to have reminded myself about that. Yeah. Should we jump into uh next cloud dashboard here? Yeah. This week, believe it or not, title aside, I will be going over next cloud dashboard, basically the hub, essentially the hub. So go, in, go into the history about this it, really, really quick. So I think it was 20.0 that it was released. I think you'd know more about the history than I would. I think you'd have to cover this history. Um, I know it was released 20.0 as just kind of like a, a beta. Does that sound right? And then 21, it really came out as, hey, this is the default here. And with the default, basically you were able to get this dashboard when you log in. It's it, Rather than dropping you right to your files... It may, it's this pretty way now to show basically a sna I call it a snapshot of everything digital in your life. Basically, with a dashboard, you get all these widgets. Essentially, it, at twenty one, you get all these widgets. So, in being when you log in, you're not being dumped to files. Yeah, managing I call it managing your digital life. Digital. It gives you a little snapshot of your day, kind of like what we wanted to do with Portal. Similar to that, it's basically, I would call it similar to that in the sense that you've got all these integrations and widgets now that you can mm -hmm. integrate and talk with, and basically you can configure them. So on your NextCloud login, you're seeing not just NextCloud updates, but updates to external services, you know, GitLab, GitHub, Twitter, Reddit, Mail, Calendar, and they had reports out there, which you can just really get really pretty fancy with. Um, but I like that kind of navigating your digital life example. It made the most sense to me uh, with it. So like, yeah, cause what, what's, what's the dashboard for? Like what's, what is this? Like it was, is so instead of coming at it, I think next. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's where I kind of want to go instead of being dropped here. This is kind of the big sell I saw from dashboard is instead of being dropped, Instead of logging in the drop, uh, instead of logging in the next cloud and kind of seeing it as, hey, here are all the files, you know, similar to like a Dropbox type thing. This is now next cloud's trying to say, hey, we do more than just files. You're not just going to log in here for files. You're going to log in here for kind of getting 
an overview. And I think they've done a really good job. I think they've done a great job with adding all the app integrations. Now, don't get me wrong. I think using mail and cap and contacts as their own separate applications. I, I do love my Thunderbird um, are more suitable. Nextcloud does provide the ability to, you know, manage multiple mailboxes and, you know, have a, you have your calendar right there and you know you also have all your contacts right there and you have them in the cloud you have them in the cloud on on a server they're out there you don't have to worry about hey what happens if my house floods and you know my laptop with home everything every my digital life just gets washed it's like you don't have to worry about that if it's in a data center somewhere unless it's in Germany, wherever that data center burnt down. Oh, OB8. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Europe. Um, yeah, no, we don't, we don't maintain our instances there. No, but I really think it's next cloud's push to go, Hey, we do more than just files. We're doing everything digital. So as I was kind of saying, you can customize your dashboard to add really all kinds of widgets to the front. Um, the ones I, integrated with and the integrations are actually awesome they're pretty slick um i added github notifications get lab to do's reddit news twitter notifications you can add a twitter home um i'm trying to think there was one more so if you add apps certain apps get certain widgets with them that you can customize and enable so context calendar and mail were ones that you could add widgets for but i'll tell you what getting set up with the widgets and just enabling them was a breeze. It was easy. Now, the two ones I had trouble with were, um, let's see here, GitLab and GitHub. Basically, you need to create a personal access token uh, for the API to be able to read um, your to-dos. And I think it was GitHub was the, any notifications you have on your account. But everything else, I have a picture in the documentation. Essentially, your browser pops up this little, like a pop-up bar, if you're familiar with those, if everyone's familiar with those, and it says, hey, would you like to allow authentication with, would you like to allow Nextcloud authentication with this app? And so Twitter and Reddit, and I think it was one more, were as easy as, you know, allow this to contact Reddit and log me in through my Reddit account. So basically what I did was you just hit allow, it redirects you to Reddit and Reddit goes, Reddit gives you an auth page and it says, Hey, would you like to allow your next cloud instance to be able to read? And I, you know, of course, yeah, I want, I was setting this up anyway and it sets it up and it just gives you your home news right there. So it's pretty sweet. I thought it was awesome, especially for that easy integration versus going out and I don't know about you going out and creating personal access tokens for every single app that I authenticate with it. It takes time. It does take time. And you think with at least GitHub being how I'll just call it corporate. It is just how like, you know, they, I think they have authenticate with GitHub. GitHub. Um, I see it all over the place. Um, You'd think they'd have some kind of allow authentication just one click like hey let me authenticate with this really easy but unfortunately they make you go in and create the personal access token to get that read access for it so Mm, okay but it's pretty cool um i'll tell you what if canboard had one of those it would be awesome it if it gave so it has jira integration already i don't know if you saw that i think it has tasks out there if i'm not mistaken that would be pretty slick if they had a can board like uh just kind of show a quick board view or just or just my front page yeah my front page dashboard yeah i'm sure it can be done they're both written (laughs) both written in php (laughs) crack out your uh php if you want to write one (laughs) right still customization for it you know, I would if I wasn't so deep into Ruby. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, actually, that the 
add integration or add application, like that authentication blew my mind. So I'm so used to going in and creating third party access tokens. I know I've, this isn't even like the main feature of dashboard. This is just like something I found really cool, but. I think that's OAuth. I'm pretty sure that's OAuth. That it's using? Mm -hmm. I, I, because... I'm gonna have to look into it more. I don't know why GitHub wouldn't allow or why the integration with GitHub was that difficult then. I don't know or why they make why would they would make you go in know. and. But I know like one of the things for for Twitch, right? If I'm logged into my Twitch account, and one of the streamers I follow has a song request list, right? That's hosted on a third party server. I will follow the link in chat for the song request list and it'll bump me over there and it'll say, all right, only authenticated users can request songs, right? Sure. So it says log in with Twitch and I click that. It sees the cookie and it's like, it would like, like to know this gotcha. about your Twitch account. And I'm like, yes, do that. Allow. And it, yeah. Pulls it. And yeah. then, and then from that third party site, when I request a song in the Twitch chat for the streamer, it'll pop up, you know, Andrew requested whatever song. Yeah. So yeah, no, that, that OAuth two is, is being used all over the place and it's super convenient specifically for Every, that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's crazy is you, I, I, you know, I always think of OAuth being provided by a massive provider. I don't think of, and you don't think of, you know, NC demo dot com making a pull out and being and saying to Reddit or what, you know, all these different services. Hey, can I log, if I log in as this user, can I read this? And it's just very easy. It's very easy. It's Reddit. It's just like, Hey, did you want to give access to this one site? And it's like, I actually did. That was me. Yeah. Next thing you know, you've got, you know, you've got it. So, but other than that, I don't have much, much else on dashboard. Really just the uh, quick overview there on, you know, customizing it, adding adding all the widgets, um, adding when you add certain applications, you get the the ability to add the widgets with them. And then, you know, the OAuth integration with it or making you sign in to GitLab user 2FA and that's like create personal token. So um, that's everything. That's really very quick. Actually, that's it. Sounds like it's going to be a really good uh, integration session. Yeah, on on the YouTube page. So um, I will I will most definitely be putting a video out on that. Probably looking into a couple of those widgets, seeing if there's anything else. I know we went through a couple of apps uh, previously. Uh, did you see if any of those had different widgets, or did you did you do any kind of? So deep I didn't dive check any. Kind of see what. Okay. I I didn't check third party. Um. The main ones were the ones that were just came supported by Nextcloud, really, that were applications. So I, I already touched on them: contacts, calendar, mail. Mm -hmm. Those have pretty neat widgets. Um, yeah, I mean, but really, it's, it's just it's an inbox nice. view, an yeah. account, you know, calendar. It's kind of what you could expect from a calendar view. It gives you just a snapshot of the day, basically. It's like, tw you know, twelve to twelve. I wonder if you could. Well, yeah, that would probably work on shared calendars too. So like if someone was there and I shared mine with you or you with me and then you could see my calendar, yeah, you know, that'd be pretty cool. But I did not check third party, uh, any of the other third party applications. Um, I couldn't imagine how I, like, a hash an EPUB, <laughs> right, or an EPUB reader. <laughs> it's gonna do pop open a book for you. I I don't know, man. <laughs> um, I you think there was it one your books directory. There was one you could you you could. Uh there was one I think built in. Uh it was read files. You know, it showed a list of recently touched files, which it's there. And I'm I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not the biggest proponent of looking at recent files, but it it's there. It's there if you need it. There if you want it. Sure. Sure. That's it. That's everything I had. It was a quick one. It was a very quick one. Um Okay. I'd recommend, you know, I it comes in it's built in by default. I'd recommend checking it out for anyone that hasn't. 
Well, um, you will check it out by default because it's the first thing you're going to see. Yeah, anymore, on right? The next cloud, yeah, yeah, because we currently do run twenty, and it is by default there. It's there, or at yeah. least the twi- latest twenty version. So that is that is currently uh, on by default. So the hub. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so. I think it's interesting. I, I want to see. I want to see what widgets can go now. If if we get a cam band cam board one, I will absolutely. That will be my homepage. Like done, done, easy. <laughs> So. I don't know. What do you think about the uh, landing into that? I'll call it a widget that hub instead of landing into files. You like well, it? Dislike it, it? It illustrates the trajectory that Nextcloud is following. It started right. out as a Dropbox alternative, so obviously the first thing you're going to do is deal Get with files. files. Right. Yeah. What it has evolved into is a G Suite alternative or, you know, a, a Yahoo alternative where you log in, you have your context calendar, um, all your, your daily stuff, all your links, your news, your that is supposed to be your hub. So if, if NextCloud has gone from a Dropbox replacement to a G Suite replacement, it only makes sense this is that the way they get- it starts... Yeah, it, 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 they transition from having the default view as the files and transition it to having the default view as a dashboard. That's, I mean, I, I'm i totally yeah. behind them. I mean, obviously, there's there's always going to be trade-offs, but if this is the way they feel like they need to push the product, I am I don't have any arguments. Behind. Yeah. And speaking of arguments... You can't win them, is what I found out when I read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Nice. Love it. Nice. So, which is which is the way he starts our part three. So, we've, we've obviously gone over the past uh, couple of episodes, parts one and two, uh, in How to Win Friends and Influence People. Let me grab it. Mr. Paper Copy over there. Still, I, I copied all these by hand, and that's not an insignificant amount of notes right there, I'll tell you that. Went through 12 chapters this episode. So, the first section, he he outlined in three chapters really what I think the rest of the book is about. So, yeah. we saw in part two, uh, he was talking about how to care about people, right? We, we show how to demonstrate that you care about people, how to be actively engaged with people, how to, uh, how to care for people. And this is part three, how to win people to your way of thinking. Um, so this is, this is his, uh, big secret of, of dealing with people really. And, I believe the takeaway from this one was you have to make people want to do a thing in order for them to actually ever do it. Right. And there are 12 chapters that go through that. Uh, Eight. Yeah. And he talks about a whole bunch of way to interact with people uh, respectfully and how to present your opinions in a way that doesn't infuriate them. So it's a, it, it was a it was a good read, specifically for myself. And he starts off with saying, you can't win an argument. Suppose you triumph over, over the other man and shoot his argument full of holes and prove that he is non compos mentis, which is fancy Latin for saying out of your brain, out of, out of your gourd. You will feel fine. But what about him? You have made him feel inferior which is the opposite of important, by the way. You have hurt his pride, and he will resent your triumph. And, additionally, I like this little this little couplet here. Yeah. He said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And I'm like, oh, that's good. That's really good. So no matter how much you actually do convince someone, even if you do still convince them against right their the will. Right in the back of their mind. They got it. They're at the back of the mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, whatever. He's, that's dumb. I, I, don't, I don't actually believe that. So so you can't win an argument is what he's, he's saying here. 
so he, he he goes through and and talks about that the the end of the chapter had a very interesting uh takeaway so it was it was how to keep a disagreement from becoming an argument i actually had, sure. had a chance to use this recently but like how do you how do you keep a disagreement from becoming an argument? Because it's not bad to disagree, right? Right. Which People is can the have first point. Welcome, right. welcome, welcome the disagreement. Uh, the 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 point uh, I think he made here. I'm gonna I want to read it because I I do like it a lot. Uh, the point he made was that when two partners always agree, one of them is not necessary. Sure. That means you're just talking to yourself, and at that point you're just right. crazy. Right. So, so you're you're two different people. You're not going to have the same opinions on stuff. You're going to have to on talk everything. There's going right, to be some kind right. of a disagreement, and then when you disagreement, welcome the disagreement. That will make it not an argument, right? If you if you will say, hey, we're not disagreeing. There's there's no disagreement. Then that's going to turn into an argument pretty quick. A couple other points here. Uh, distrust your first instinctive impression. Don't have a knee jerk reaction. Control your temper. Listen first. And actually, that was that was touched on once again, the, the very final part of that chapter. Uh, there was someone who had made a pact with his wife, and he said, uh, we always agree that when someone ends up yelling, the other person listens, because you're never going to get anything done with two people yelling. Right. So I'm like, all right, that that's fair. Sure. Uh, next, uh, look for areas of agreement. Sure. Be honest. Big one there. Not an easy one either. It's easy to say, but it's not easy to do. Promise to think over your opponent's ideas and study them carefully. That's very important. Thank your opponents sincerely for your interest, because I guarantee if they didn't care, they would not be arguing with you or or, or even disagreeing with you. They would just let it go. They would right. say, you know what? I don't even care about that sucker. Like I don't, you know. So, so they have some type of interest there. At least they care about you for or care about something, right? So, acknowledge that. Uh, and then postpone actions to give both sides time to think through the problem. And that is my most difficult one to to follow. What's that? Postponing action to give both sides time to think through the problem exactly that yes. one is why is that or why would yeah. you say any particular well, I think, reason i think personally for me especially as i'm very task oriented i want to check the box off yeah and i want to archive that email thread and i want to sure. finish up this meeting and i don't want to have a follow-up meeting you know so if i can get this completed then i can push that off my plate and work on some something else um, but it's often the case that, especially if there is a staunch disagreement, and I'm thinking of a very relevant incident recently, uh, it may be better if I push it off to, you know, if, if you know, and it, it, it's not something that we went through, but, you know, having a, a set time for a, a meeting of discussion, right? Or, right. or you know, some, some time, um, I know, Sam and I, uh, my roommate and I have a uh, set time where we sit down. And we're like, all right, we're going to have a house meeting. We always order like wings, right? And yeah, and uh, wings and fries, right? And we just sit down, we eat wings. And we're like, hey, you got anything to ring up? Nope. You? Nope. All right, cool. But that is exactly the time nice. when, yeah. if, you know, if you have a disagreement, you're like, all right, well. Say it, let's, yeah. We, let's have this out, right? So. So if if it makes sense to postpone the action to give both sides time to think through the problem, I'd say absolutely do it. Um, so his, his, his takeaway principle here is the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. And I'm – you can agree, but don't argue about it. And to preface the rest of this, I'm going to run through all the chapters, I think. Um, okay. I – it, it seems like I have a, a, enough time. I might skip through. I did make notes on all of them, uh, but if something sticks out, I mean, I'd be more than willing to, to drill down and converse it. on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, next chapter: a Sure way to make of making enemies and how to avoid it. 
Uh, men must be taught as if you taught them not, and things unknown proposed as things forgot. By the way, I love it when stuff rhymes. Like it's th- any yeah 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 yeah. Uh, that was by Alexander Pope. Um, uh, Galileo similarly said, uh, "Men, you cannot teach a man anything. You can only help him to find it within himself." Sure. Uh, and then Socrates or Socrates, as some lovingly call him. One thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. Uh, so Dale's point here was that instead of stating the facts of others' incorrectness, posit that the possibility exists of your mistakenness, and then proceed from there. And, and those are, are my words, but definitely lead off with saying, hey, I may be wrong. Let's take a look. Right. right. Don't right. lead off and... I think you're wrong because there, there's a people don't there's like a that mile of difference. People do Let not say, like that. I could be wrong. I could be assuming something. I could be forgetting something. I could not. Can we go over where you're yeah. at? Yeah. And, and at that point, you're coming to a level table. You're you're coming to a discussion. You know, as as equals or or really as someone who's trying to learn who's trying to understand someone from their point of view and that is a lot better off saying i think i know more than you because of slam paper on the floor or on the on the table yeah exactly on the desk yeah never gonna win friends or influence people so his principle here is to show respect for the other person's opinions never say you're wrong easy enough and follows that up with If you're wrong, admit it. Admit it. Sure. Uh, If we know that we're going to be rebuked anyhow, isn't it far better to beat the other person to it and do it ourselves? Isn't it much easier to listen to self-criticism than to bear condemnation from alien lips? He said the best thing to do is admit it quickly and emphatically. Yeah. The next best thing to do is admit it emphatically. Yeah. Uh, There was actually this – I do remember this story in the book and – and it, it stood out to me because it's in a different culture than the Western culture. It was in it was in one of the Asian cultures, Japanese or, or Chinese, where it's very honor and, and family oriented. And the the illustration was of a dad whose father or, or, or dad whose son embarrassed the family or something and there was a big schism and you know, it was everyone's pride and, you know it it, it wasn't as, as affected clean cut. every uh, Yeah. Yeah, is that, but, like, the dad found out he was in the wrong, but he he couldn't apologize to his son because, like, his honor would not let him apologize to his progeny, right? And that's that was just not something that got done. And after, after you know, his taking the course or, you know, learning about this, this way of thinking, he said, well, it's too late to do it quickly, but I can at least do it emphatically, right? And... He was able to do it, you know, in front of the important people of his family and say, you know, publicly, hey, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I want to apologize. You know, and I was wrong, yada, yada, yada. And and do it in in a way that was very monumental for everyone involved. Right. And and saying it very emphatically, emotion, not emotionally, but like like putting weight behind his words. He 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 meant it. And he by it, right, doing right. so, he was able to come to a better yeah uh, come 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 to a conclusion on it like he he didn't have to have that gnawing away at him for the rest of his life right he was able to to wrap that up so i i i did like that example i didn't write it down here but the principle is that if you are wrong admit it quickly and emphatically right that's a good one um especially if you're doing server reboots and you accidentally reboot a server that was not supposed to be rebooted it's better be out in front yes. say hey this isn't a crash i accidentally rebooted it um not a personal anecdote for me but i have definitely seen happen <laughs> way more than i should <laughs> so oh yeah no i've that could be a personal anecdote of mine and i mean i've 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 made plenty of excuses or uh, plenty of mistakes uh what i don't want to make is excuses so i i, I just kind of want to own up to it I was gonna say I think that follows that same vein, just getting out in front of it versus yeah. last thing you want to, and it kind of goes with that uh, 
bear con- bearing condemnation from alien limps. You don't want to hear it from someone else. You already know what you did. You know, you better just get out in front of it than let it come to you. Yeah. Uh, the next chapter is something I actually wanted to follow up with your last episode where you were talking about um, faking it till you make it, right? When you're like, I want oh, yeah, to yeah 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 the uh yeah, singing stand and up smiling and, and, put and on yeah, a good yeah, face yeah 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 sure so this this was actually entitled a drop of honey and it could be forced honey it could be faked honey but it's honey nonetheless uh Abraham Lincoln said if you would win a man to your cause first convince him that you are his sincere friend therein a, is a drop of honey that catches his heart which say what you will is the great high road to his reason so you, you you're not going to be able to reason with a guy until you can he sees you as his friend right um there was a story in the book as well about a tenant uh, who was renting some property and uh, he he couldn't pay or, or needed a, a reduction and he's like you know what let me let me call the landlord in here right so he did and he was he was see like someone was broken too and he was like seething and he was like you know what what if i what if I just greeted him as a friend? Like, and I, I brought him in and I said, Hey, you want some tea? Hey, look at this neat little painting, right? I got it at the flea market. You know, he's just, he's just being hospitable to the guy. Uh, and eventually he was able to, to win him over and have him see reason and, and talk to him about his difficulties without it being an argument. Uh, And he said, if I'd tried the methods the other tenants were using, which the landlord was actually like talking, he's like, you would guess what the other tenants, I got like 14 letters from this one guy. This one other dude said he was going to break his rent and like, you know, smash up his apartment. And he's like, so the landlord's like coming to him with his problems. Dude's like, if I tried the methods the other tenants were using, I am positive I should have been met in the same failure that they encountered. It was a friendly, sympathetic appreciative approach that one um and, and the keywords being friendly sympathetic and appreciative yeah uh, i liked i like those three those three really resonated with me um and you know showing showing his anger would wouldn't serve any worthwhile purpose right it it might feel good it might be cathartic it might be great you know when you feel like you want to drive your fist through a wall right just to let that build Right. It's not going to help you when you come to deal with people. Right. Not at all. So the fourth principle here uh, is begin begin in a friendly way. Totally. First set of principles was um, basically when when you start off hostile, everyone kind of raises their wall up and goes into defense mode. It's that same kind of thing. So beginning in a friendly way, you can have the open discussion about it. Yeah. You want to you want to make sure to to come at them as a friend, not as anything else. Right. Right. Uh, okay. I'll, yeah. Uh, next chapter, The Secret of Socrates. Um, and, and you might have already guessed what this is by the, the title if you've ever heard the term Socratic method. Right. Now, that's a method of discussion where Socrates starts to find common ground or at least agreement uh, and then works his way up there and makes sure to agree at every single point. And if you disagree at some point, you follow that rabbit trail until you you come there and then you agree your way out of that rabbit trail and keep going until you find another true rabbit trail. Go down to your disagreement, agree your way back out of that rabbit trail and then continue on agreeing, which Leading. is a time consuming way to have an sure. argument. And and some might say a not altogether efficient way, but it does cover cover all the bases, right? And it it can be frustrating to to spend all that time and effort and clarify everything. And um, sometimes people use leading questions, and then you gotta diffuse those. And but foundations of it is are pretty sound. And Dale turns it on its not on its head. But he talks about what happens if if you do genuinely want to influence someone using the same technique. He said, once having said a thing, you feel you must stick to it. Hence, it is of the very greatest importance that a person be started in the affirmative direction. 
So get people saying yeses. He says the more yeses we can get at the very outset, the more likely we are to succeed in capturing the attention of our ultimate proposal. And Jack, I know I've shot you over several of Jason's webinars and stuff, and they usually end with, have I provided you value? Did you find this valuable? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Was this worth your time? Yes. Well, I, I yeah. can keep providing stuff that's worth your time. And if you'd like to do that, here is the way, you know, so he, he starts you saying yes. Right. And then rolls, rolls that right into Here's it. Here's a link so to it. Right. used to saying yes. Leading and then once having it. said that, yes, you're more likely to continue on with that. Yes. So it's a, it's a very not subtle <laughs> psychological trick, but it's, it's, it's honest, right? I mean, you're saying, Hey, did, did I do good? Right? Did you did you like what I did? Because I can I would love to do more of it for you. Here's how. And if you say no, then that's the end of this discussion at that point. <laughs> well, that's, that's I don't know about you that. Time. You disagree. You, you just that lead them down the rabbit hole. But, well, why not? Right. <laughs> but I think. I think right, there were right, a couple right, right, of right, different right, things right, sure. that were pointed out in this chapter that I didn't necessarily see being explicit. So I, I wanted to line them out here. So I said you can get people to agree fairly readily on one of three things, right? And I said the hard mode is agreeing on common ground. So finding some kind of common ground, saying we both believe in this, and then going from there. The, the easy mode is saying, let's agree on how you understand this problem to me. Like, am I, am I representing your belief correctly? And then you can start, sure. you, you can get them agreed. So, so you mean that this, and then that means sure. that you also think this, and, and you can get them agreeing in, in, in that way. While you're not finding common ground, you're at least showing them that you understand their, their argument, their, their side of the story, and you're also getting them to say yes. Uh, now, Represent, the right, very right. easiest way, the, the, the training wheels kind of way that I, that I put down here is, is objective facts. Because you don't even have to understand the other person's point of view, and you just say the sky's blue, right? And they'll say, "Well, maybe," and then you got an argument on your hands. But you know, you you, you start and saying, "All right, well, we we both are 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 working here on this." Um, oh, that, that'd even be common ground. You, you know, you're saying, "Well, this is a system that we both have to deal with." Yes, right. We are both trying to accomplish this and you're like yes right and this is connected Check. to this in this way yes right so you're just agreeing on right. objective facts you're not trying to see things from their point of view you're not trying to find common ground you're just stating the facts and if you can at least get them to agree on the facts then you can move up to their representation of the facts and then you can go move up to your differing belief systems based on those those facts and those representations so if, if you can't get literally anything else, you can always try to start agreeing on objective facts. I wouldn't try to start there. I would definitely try to say, hey, I, I think you're coming at it from this angle because that, that shows that you've actually put in some effort to understand their point of view. And if you're able to do that, then you can move forward with the conversation at a little bit more fast pace than you otherwise would if you're literally just stating facts. Uh, and the old Chinese proverb that I liked is, he who treads softly goes far. So uh, a little bit of uh, he who construction there. You start off. That's a, that's a great way to start a proverb, by the way. If you ever want to sound wise, to start it off with he who does something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He who. <laughs> so uh, and, and, and the principle that Dale comes comes away with is get the other person saying yes, yes, immediately. Uh and then next is almost the flip side of this. He starts talking about the quote unquote safety valve in handling complaints, which is exactly what you would think it would be in it shut up. Right. And not in so many words, let the other people talk themselves out. They know more about their business and problems than you do. Uh, you get to do this by asking clarifying questions. 
Keep in mind that the problems sure. that you thought they had might not be the ones that they're most concerned with. By letting them talk themselves out, you're allowing them to dig deep and reveal their true concerns and cares. Right? This, especially when you're you're sitting there and you, you come to the conversation with with uh, a really, you know, especially if you're angry, right? You're, you're already projecting into their head what their concerns about, what they're, they may be angry about, right? And if, if you're, you're still coming at it with, with that point of view, right? And, and you start letting them talk and they take a completely left turn where you didn't expect them to, well, now you're learning something, right? And that's more information than you had before and you can change based off of that. That's that's really valuable information, not only in just selling, but just in handling complaints, right? Just in handling relationships. Yeah. They know way more about their problems than you ever will. So so stop trying to think that you ever will and just accept the fact that you have to let them tell you what you can help with. Um, so the next principle then is let the other person do a great deal of the talking. Um, as I have been doing, uh, and since that has uh, wrapped up six of the 12, I was wondering if you, uh, you had any thoughts on, on any of those or, or if I should just keep going here. No, I kind of I interjected when I wanted to. Uh, now with this past one here, um, principle six, and letting the other person do a great deal of talking, the one I really like, we, I think we talked on it, I, I love – referencing past podcasts it's um i think it was on a sales one honestly when we were talking about sales and i think it was a different book it's it reminded me of the conversation you have with your mom actually i think you said she was going through a move and you said you know you say can i help and it's a yes or no it's you have to rephrase the question what can i do to help you know how how can i actually help you and you know i think this kind of goes in that same line where it's like well if you just let them talk talk through anything it's like well you know how's the move going fine well you know are you moving all the boxes around are you moving everything in the house are you getting stuff out of the basement are you getting stuff out of the attic are you getting stuff from upstairs and you know you just let them go basically and talk on it and then it turns into well what can i help you and then you kind of find a specific problem to almost narrow in on and say hey do you want me to help you with x or can i help with y or do you want me to help you in some other you know do you want me to pray for you? Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do, and you kind of narrow in on that problem by letting them kind of tell you what the problem is first. So that was the one thing I had for that sixth principle, but nothing else to add. Sounds good. Well, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep going on. So the next chapter is how to get cooperation. Uh, and, and I really just had this one quote from the book because I think it summed it up perfectly. There weren't any stellar examples or, or really anything out of the ordinary. It's, it's, it's a straightforward idea, but it's an idea that you have to come to yourself because don't you have much more faith in ideas that you discover for yourself than in ideas that are handed to you on a silver platter? If so, you know, he's, he's saying he's getting you to say yes, 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 yes. If so... Isn't it bad judgment to try to ram your opinions down the throats of other people? And therefore, isn't it wiser to make suggestions and let the other people think out the conclusion? And that one's hard because I would much rather go to the goal. That's that's how to get there. Here's how to get there. I'm there already. Let me just throw you a rope and I will tug you along. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. But no, no. In order to get cooperate, this isn't even to convince someone. This is simply to get cooperation. This is if you want people working with you in tandem, you have to allow them to have faith in these ideas. And, and to do that, they have to come to them on their own. Right. I, I, I go back up to the uh, Alexander Pope. Excuse me. Men must be taught as if you taught them not, and things unknown proposed as things forgot. Right. So you're still only proposing. You're not. You're not dictating to them, right? You're not handing them down some an edict from on high. You're saying, "Hey, is this? How's this? How's this being right. worked out? Are we able to work this out? Like, should we go into 
the forest over there or the forest over there or the path right down the middle. And so I was like, whoa, you know what? I bet if we went down the path, we right. wouldn't get eaten by like like lions and tigers and bears. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> imagine that. It might that. be the best option. <laughs> no poison ivy. That'd be awesome. So as you have already traversed this thing 25 times, like sw- clearing it out. Doing everything but paving it with, like, yellow, yellow brick road kind of thing. You're like, really? The path, huh? Okay. <laughs> All facetiousness aside, let the other pe- person feel that the idea is is theirs. And if not if not completely theirs, let them at least have buy-in. You know, let them, let them at sure. least contribute their ideas or, you know, be a part of the discussion as you're having it. Because no one likes – we talk about autonomy, mastery, purpose – one of the key elements of autonomy is not having stuff handed to you from on high, right? You, you have to be, you have to have input into that discussion. You have to be a part of that process. So let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. The next one, which I took way too many quotes on, I, I, I guess is a formula that will work wonders for you. So I'm just, I'm just going to read this and, and feel free to interject. Remember that other people may be totally wrong, but they don't think so. Okay. Don't condemn them. Any fool can do that. Try to understand them. Only sure. wise, tolerant, exceptional people even try to do that. There is a reason why the other man thinks and acts as he does. Ferret out that reason, and you have the key to his actions, perhaps his personality. Try to put yourself in his place. Seeing things through another person's eyes may ease tensions when personal problems become overwhelming. Tomorrow, before asking anyone to put out a fire or buy your product or contribute to your favorite charity, why not pause and close your eyes and try to think the whole thing through from the other person's point of view? Ask yourself, why should he or she want to do it? True, this will take time. But it will avoid making enemies and will get better results and with less friction. All that saying to try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Fairly easy. This is not just for influence. You're not just asking yourself, why would they want to do that in order for me to talk to them, to influence them, to persuade them about something. You also want to make sure that this is the way you handle delicate situations, right? You, you always want to make sure that someone else has an incentive. Um, cause you, once again, you don't want to be dragging someone along, right? They, they have to want to do it right. And they, they have to have input into the process and they have to have a reason to do it. There was a, there was a good takeaway from this book. Um, and I'd, I'd actually completely forgotten about it uh, until I reread it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I thought that was really good the last time I read this. And he said that I would rather walk the sidewalk in front of a person's office for two hours before an interview than step into that office without a clear idea of what I was going to say and what that person, from my knowledge of his or her interests and motives, was likely to answer. Now, no one's an empath. You can't. Y- y- accurately but you can kind of judge how people are going to react to something right. that you say so think it through first and understand where they're coming from uh, see things from their point of view so that you can not only be ready but be willing to help them so i thought that was that was a good takeaway like liter- literally imagine imagine standing outside a building like getting getting ready f- for for talking with someone, whether it's a, a sales call or a disciplinary action or, or what have you, right? A good, a good situation, a bad situation, I don't care. Sitting yeah. outside a, a store, getting ready to, you know, walk in there or, or getting outside an office, getting ready to walk in there, just walking the pavement back and forth for two hours, thinking through all the possible scenarios that you can come up with, right? And, and sitting there and be like, all right, what is he or she most likely to say? You know, what what are they most likely to come back with if I open up with this? How are they going to take it if I 
talk about their competition that way? Or what if I bring up this past experience that we had? So there's, there's just so many things that, that you can go through that taking the time to do that is respectful to them. And at least some of that is bound to come through for you to say, Hey, I, I can tell that you actually do care about this. You, you actually are coming through as, as putting effort into the relationship that we have. And, and that's what this book is all about. You know, how to win friends and influence people isn't about how to win friends and influence people. It's how to save and maintain relationships. Dale did give us a little magic phrase here in the next chapter. So besides, besides the fundamental and, and kind of the overarching ideas, there is some, some pretty cool advice that, that he doles out here. He, he calls this chapter what everybody wants. He says that there's a magic phrase that, will, that stops arguments, that eliminates ill feeling, that creates goodwill, and makes the other person listen attentively. Like, so if, if you really need to, to, to get on someone's good side, this break, break this out, right? In a pinch, break this out, which is, I don't blame you one bit for feeling as you do. If I were you, I would undoubtedly feel just as you do. It works. I love. I I don't know if they both both sentences need to end in do. I I, I feel I, like uh, <laughs> just getting into the rhyme. Is this book a book on rhymes now? <laughs> but no, seriously. I mean, it's you're empathizing with the other person, and you're 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 basically just putting yourself in their shoes and just saying, "Hey, look, I don't blame you for the way you're feeling." And it's definitely kind of like a. I don't know if I'd call it a scapegoat or a cop out, but you're basically just saying, "Hey, I, maybe you don't feel, maybe you don't feel like them." But if, if when you say that to them, they at least kind of recognize that and know. And we are emotional creatures, right? We we deal in emotions every single day. We we have a lot of them that that come and go, and and unfortunately, we probably act on more of them than we should. But stopping and and recognizing that is at least one way to say, "Hey, I recognize that you're." You have emotions right now. Let's, I, I, you know, I'm human being too. I would have those exact same emotions, you know, given your circumstances. And, you know, he, he goes on to put ourselves in perspective, right? As, as the first person in this, in this scenario, he says, you deserve very little credit for being what you are. Remember the people who come to you are irritated, bigoted, unreasoning, deserve very little discredit for being what they are. Feel sorry for them. Pity them and sympathize with them. Say to yourself, there but for the grace of God go I. And he follows it up with, most of the people you will ever meet are hungering and thirsting for sympathy. Give it to them and they'll love you for it. It's really not that hard. You know, make, making sure to, to acknowledge their feelings. People feel, right? And they feel because things happen. That's, you know, you know that you deal with that every day. I know that I deal with that every day, right? Because we're humans. Right. So right. if someone comes to you irritated, right, maybe they're not following the best practices of this book. Maybe they haven't read it in the past year. Maybe they need to go reread it again. But for whatever reason, they've they've let themselves lose control and they are irritated or bigoted or unreasoning, right? Uh, despite whatever whatever you have. Make sure to acknowledge that, you know what, of course we're not perfect, right? It's, I understand that at this point you feel the way you do. And I, I, I would undoubtedly feel just as you do. So be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Uh, and then another life hack here that Dale discloses is an appeal that everybody likes. Um, and he says, usually a person usually has two reasons for doing a thing. One that sounds good and a real reason. And I've said this before. People will come up to you and, and give you a reason. The first, the first response, they're probably lying, right? The, the first thing they come up with, they're, pro they're probably lying. And it could be to themselves. 
but you're going to have to dig deeper. So people are honest and want to discharge their obligations. The exceptions to that rule are comparatively few, and I'm convinced that the individuals who are inclined to chisel will, in most cases, react favorably if you make them feel that you consider them honest, upright, and fair. Right? So that, the way to defeat that initial impulse, right, uh, especially when you're getting attacked or if you're forced to defend yourself, um, or, or really even if you're just forced to give an account, right, people will have a, two reasons, right? One that sounds good and, and, and real run. So they're, they'll, they'll give you the one that sounds good first, right? And then he's saying the here reason. that appeal to yeah. them, uh, uh, appeal to their honesty and their uprightness and say, hey, you're an honest guy, right? I trust you to tell me exactly why, you know, why, why this, this happened this way. And they're like, well actually come to think of it there's also this other thing right and you're like all right yeah thanks for being honest with me and that's that's part of cultivating that environment of you know non-retributory or, or whatever you want to call it you know no blame yada yada but you can say hey thanks for being honest with you i i know i can trust you to be honest right and you gotta have that you gotta have that with them already or give them the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, I, I believe that you can be honest with me or I believe that you can be upright with, with me and then move on from there. Um, so that, that principle then is appeal to the nobler motives. Um, continuing on with the life hacks, uh, this one's actually fairly obvious. Uh, the movies do it. TV does it. Why don't you do it? He's, he's being dramatic. Which is actually, ironically enough, the point of this chapter. Uh, yeah. He's saying that merely stating the truth isn't enough. The truth has to be made vivid, interesting, and dramatic. You have to use showmanship. People, yes, yes. No doubt people want a story. They want the story. They buy the story. They don't buy the, this is the truth. They don't buy that. People like the story with it. They grip. That's what gives them something to hold on to, which you and I, I know both love the, give me the facts. But the truth is, I can say this. I'll say this for myself. Guess what I remember? I don't remember just the straight facts when they're listed. I remember the example. I always remember. I usually remember the example, the story that came with it, the story driving yeah, home it, the point. It, it, you, and now I don't know if you feel that, if you're that same way or you can fool yourself you just into like saying, the facts yeah you can you, you can, can fool yourself into all saying facts. all i care about is the facts but the story but the thing that's going to stick in your head and the thing that's going to influence you as you're going day to day is, is going to be the story and this is is this if you want facts this is scientifically like there was I, did did we go over that silent bid uh that that silent auction story i forget what that was but like it was it was It was like someone brought a whole bunch of random junk to like a, uh, not a yard sale, like an, uh, uh, call it like a swap, like a, a swap meet kind of thing. And it was, it was junk. Like it was, there, there, there was nothing of value here. It was like old knickknacks and stuff from people's houses and stuff. And there were, there were like two groups and, and someone just sold it as is. And then someone created a whole backstory for it, a narrative behind the item, right? And it it changed what the value of that item was. Not only just perceived value, but like actual monetary value of it. Because it's like, this is the doll that my great grandmother had in the Second World War and she carried it with her the whole way. And it w wasn't important in anything, but it was like super personal to her. And, you know, it, it, it's flown through several countries, you know, and it's been handed all the way through down through my family. That that's going to be that's going to be a lot more interesting than this is. This has a, a, a 12 stitch weave and it's 12 ounces and made of 100 percent cotton. You know, it, it, same doll, completely different perceptions. Yeah. So principle 11 is is dramatize your ideas um, and. Usually that's going to be with a story. So if, if you don't know where to start, look up storytelling, um, learn, learn how to tell a story. And there's, I mean, we come from an oral tradition there. There are fundamental ways to tell a story. You look at a story like, like star Wars, right? That's, that's a story, 
right? You look at, well, not the sequels. Don't watch the sequels. Look at, look at, you know, the, the original trilogy. They, they tell a story. And that is a story that is, is steeped in, in Western culture. And there's also Eastern culture stories. And there's, you know, uh, other, you know, all, all worldwide has, has different, different types of stories that they tell themselves and different arcs and different tropes uh, and, and different ways to, to construct a narrative. And the more you can learn about storytelling, the better you're going to be at telling your specific story. Uh, so definitely, definitely look up to that in order to dramatize your ideas. And then when nothing else works, try this. And this is, this is the one story I think out of the book that I do remember every single time. And this is uh, Charles Schwab. He had a mill manager whose people weren't producing their quota of work. Do you, do you remember this story at all? Had, had you gone through this? No. So this is... And this is this is one of my favorites, and and it is not something that works all the time, which is why it makes such a good story, because it is an exceptional situation, uh, and in this case, uh, Charles Schwab has had a mill manager of this entire mill, it's like a steel mill or something, whose people weren't producing their quota of work, and you know, going through the entire gambit of all this, talking to everyone from the lowest worker to the highest manager, you know, and using all of these types of tips and techniques, right? He, he just wasn't getting anywhere. So what he did, he finally sat down and he's like, how many batches did you guys produce to, uh, today? And the, the foreman on duty said, uh, this shift produced six. So he got out a piece of chalk, and on the ground, he just drew a huge number six. Chalk drop and walked away, right? He just, he just walked away. He's like, all right, six, right? And when he came back the next morning after the night shift, he had seen that someone had scrubbed it out and written a seven. And so the day shift guys, they're like, oh, hell no. <laughs> And so they busted their butts, and at the end of the day, they wiped it out and wrote nine, right? So they were they were trying to to get the better of each other, and and he was he was talking about here. He's like the way to get things done is to stimulate competition. I do not mean in a sordid money getting way or money grubbing way, but in the desire to excel. And I, I just thought that was such a, obviously it's a very unique yeah. situation and that's probably not the greatest way to go about doing it, but man, did it work in that scenario. It's just a really great, you know, example to hear that. So if all else fails, you know, it, people do take pride in their work. Like I take pride in my work. I know you take pride in your work, right? We, we are very proud of, of what we've been doing, right? And the way yeah, to absolutely. stimulate someone like that is to, follow principle 12 which is to throw down a challenge throw down a challenge yeah absolutely the one i was gonna th the one i had in mind was um i think it was ups they paid their night shift workers it was like a third shift they paid them um instead they were paying them hourly fine everyone was paid on an hourly basis and essentially they were going i think they were taking way long on their shift it was stuff wasn't getting completed and people wanted to go home people were just done working they said i'm this uh you know i don't want to be here um i think it one of the ups said fine guess what we're not paying we're paying you by the shift now so if you if we expect the work to take eight hours if you go over i i think they had to pay him for you know whatever they went over but everyone was dying to get out of there so if they could get it done in six they got eight hours worth of pay. So guess what they did? They actually bust, busted it out as much as they could, and they saw the increase in productivity. Hey, guess what? If we're getting paid for eight hours, I'd rather be here for just six. I don't want to stay for the full eight. But it's that stimulating that competition, like, hey, if we can beat our time, yeah, you know, if we only have to show up for six hours and get paid for eight, then of course people are going to be driven driven to do that. I do like that story. I, I, I like the one about UPS. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's more about being effective than being efficient at the end of the day. 
uh, work still had to get done, but it had to get done right. Uh, and and you're still you're still taking pride in your work, right? Um, you're still you know in 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 that in that mill, right? In that right. that steel mill. I mean, you couldn't turn out crappy steel, or else no one would get paid. And one of the ways to 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 do that is is right. to become more effective, right? We 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 talked about last episode, two episodes ago. You know, ex- excuses of of why you're going to be p- more productive next time, right? And if nothing changes, then you're just making excuses, right? So you're going to have to find a way to do more with less, right? Or or at least with the same. Uh, the the way the the way we're going now, you're going to have to do more with less, uh, as as stuff gets more and more automated stuff starts picking up. You, you have, you have more demands. Stuff becomes more specialized. I don't think I'm lying when I'm saying you're going to have to find ways to do more with less. Right. So if, if you need to find a way to direct your creativity, right. To, to harness that and, and, and get it down and, and systematize it and, and get it so that you, you, you can start sprinting in a direction, Right. Um, if you if you need to channel your passion somewhere, if you you don't know how to gather everything underneath you and use that to propel you forward, right? We we have tools just to do that, right? That's that's why we we host this. So so go ahead, go to rcompose.com, get into the newsletter, and if you're feeling adventurous, sign up for an instance today, and we'll give you that foundation for you to take off from. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Goodbye, everybody.